Okay, well, Bill, sir, if you don't mind, I want to start with you tonight. Uh, you know, when we are here in Kitty Hawk, we see all these, you know, million-dollar houses and stuff and everything, but this building we're in tonight is a little bit of living history. Can you tell us a little bit about your knowledge of uh, this was the Kitty Hawk Life Saving Station? Is that correct? That, that's right, yes. The, uh, well, not as much of it as you see here because there's been a lot of added on to each end of it. The actual original Kitty Hawk Life Saving Station is basically where you go to the uh, maitre d' and also the barn. Maybe that's important. <laughs> This section's been added on the uh, section over, and sectioned over on the uh, other side of the of the building, and maybe even the kitchen has been added on. Uh, the original Kid Hall Life Saving Station was uh, built in 1874. It was one of a number of stations that were built along the coast, roughly every 12 miles apart. And the south of us was. Uh, the Nags Head Station, and I think maybe Oregon Nillet was there, I'm not sure about that. Uh, Chick McComico and Little Kitty Keith. And that was in Very 1874. Good. In 1878, they came back and put additional stations kind of in between those. And so that's why we have uh, places like Killwood Hills and uh, Paul Gamble's Hill and places like that. Anyway, that this building, or at least the main portion of this building, was the uh, Kitty Hawk Life Saving Station. It was located across the road, somewhat east of where the dunes are today. Uh, I think in 1911 they built the second station, and th that's, the Life Saving Station became a boathouse. Now, there is a sign down here that says that the Wright brothers came here, and they did. There's a picture somewhere around here of the, uh, some of the crew that Orville took in 1900. Uh, there's also a sign that says the message was sent of the first flight from this building, and that is not correct because there was a Weather Bureau station building directly north of the life saving station. Okay. So that, uh, that's an era that keeps cropping up. So um, anyway, there was two buildings. The uh, Weather Bureau building I don't know when it was built, around 1884, 85, that period, and it stayed in existence until 1904 when they moved the Weather Bureau act activities over to um, Mania. Well, well the, weather, the Weather Bureau building here must have been pretty critical then. Uh, I know these uh, weather stations uh, uh, were very important in the scheme of things, but you know, I think you told me one time that uh, actually the U.S. Signal Corps might have been based out of uh, one of these buildings, the old wireless, or excuse me, the uh, the old communication. Uh, that, that's right. The, uh, in in uh, 1875, the uh, signal service, which had been formed in, in 1860, uh, was, was given the responsibility of, of projecting weather forecasts. And they sent uh, signal corps people down here. And originally, they operated out of the Kitty Hawk Life Saving Station until they built the Weather Bureau building separate. The, the uh, Signal Corps then became, uh, was transferred over to the Department of Agriculture and became the Weather Bureau. So it became a, a separate agency and, and also a, um, a separate building. Okay, Bill, um, <clears throat> you had a interesting dinner guest tonight. I walked in here looking for Carl and John and the crew from the Lost Colony. And uh, before we get any further into this, uh, I was quite surprised to see David Stick sitting with you tonight. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are very proud and we're very honored to have Mr. David Stick here tonight. We asked, we asked David to join us and he said, uh, that's okay, I'll sit in the audience. So we're all mortified to death up here that he's going to call us on the carpet. The, the kiss of death in storytelling on the Outer Banks is for David to accuse you of being of the Ben Dixon McNeil school of storytelling. Ben Dixon McNeil, as some of you might know, was a, a prolific writer around here, but as David likes to say, and as we now know all full too well, 
He never let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> Some of his stories were just truer than others. So uh, fortunately, David, being an old school newspaper reporter, keeps everybody uh, on their toes around it. David, thanks for all you've done for the Outer Banks, and we're just honored to have you here tonight. Uh, Bill, uh, what was the appeal of the life-saving service? You know, I mean, it was right after the Civil War. There's, I can't imagine there was a whole lot going on around here. Well, there have been a lot of uh, sailing ships that had floundered on the East Coast, and the uh, much earlier than uh, 1874, there had been a, a series of um, houses of refuges built in, up on the northern coast, up in the uh, New England area. So uh, the, I think the Metropolis was one of the ships that uh, was sunk uh, up, in Cap uh, up around uh, Kirtuck Beach and with a heavy loss of life. Also, the Huron was lost down here in, in Nags Head with a heavy loss of life, and that it, that caused the federal government to uh, establish the life saving service, and from that these stations emerged. So it was uh, it, it was to save lives and also to uh, recover uh, property. Uh, and you know, one time you told me the icing on the cake was that it was actually a paying job. Well, that's true. And uh, back in the uh, 1870s, well, uh, really all the way up into this century, um, uh, the lifesavers were probably the best paid. Unfortunately, the lifesavers did not have retirement. So uh, you might get paid pretty good during the course of the year, but uh, you didn't have a retirement. And they didn't get retirement until they, they merged the revenue cutter service and the lifesaving service merged together and, um, and became the Coast Guard. And, when, and there was a retirement clause in the Coast Guard uh, uh, legislation. Back pay, maybe? Pardon? Back pay? Back, uh, back retirement? I think there was some uh, special legislation that allowed some back pay, but I don't think it was, I don't think it was uh, automatic. Now, a couple of people retired shortly after uh, the Kitty Hawk Station, I mean, after it became a Coast Guard. A fellow by the name of Thomas Nelson Sanderlin was one who retired, and a fellow named George Washington um, Baum retired just about two or three months after they formed the Coast Guard. And they'd been, back in the life-saving service, they'd been in the service since the, uh, uh, probably 1880s. So, so they were one of the first of the uh, retired Coast Guards people down here in this community anyway. Kathleen, uh I was talking to you the other day, and uh, I told you that uh, I've never met a Kill Devil Hills native. I didn't know there was any such thing. And, uh, but you had some great stories. I mean, when we all think of Kill Devil Hills today, we realize the fact it was, if I'm not mistaken, I got the right people to correct me tonight, uh, Kill Devil Hills was actually cut out of the south end of Kitty Hawk and the north end of Nags Head. And uh, I know that you grew up right around there, what is now the stop and shop area there, Collington Intersection. Can you tell us a little bit about, uh, I know your father was a Coast Guardsman, and uh, uh, tell us a little bit about your remembrances of him. I know he was a, was a organ in it for a while, or? Oh, I mean, Dad was, I think he was a Coast Guard when he got married. He's my oh, you gotta have this. <laughs> uh, I'm not used to this, and imagine being up here with these folks that know what they're talking about. But I, but I can tell you about my dad. <laughs> um, uh, he was in the service, uh, well, I know when I was born, but I think he was even in the service when he married and stationed at Kill Devil Hills. Um, he was there when I grew up. Um, my very best friend, so many of you know her, Jeanette, Jeanette Tillett. And, um, and we would play together for years. We played together in our playhouses and made sand pies and and uh, and used the um, these seed little seed weeds and things. And that's what we would use to cook in our in our playhouses and things. And so those were all good memories of growing up. And um, but my talking about my dad now, he. What was his transfer. Name? He transferred. What was his name? Excuse me. Uh, Thomas Jefferson Harris. They called him Jeff. He transferred from this area when I was maybe a young, uh, maybe ten, something like that, and he went out to Moorhead, 
around, you know, out in that area and stayed, but didn't stay long. And when he came from there, he was back at Oregon Inlet. He was at Oregon Inlet a long time. He was there during World War II when uh, there was so many ships, you know, that were torpedoed and things. Uh, he told me many times, and I have some pictures of the boat that he thought so much of because it was a self-bailing boat and they had to go out and stay, whether the ocean was rough or whether it wasn't. They were out picking up survivors. And he said he had many times he had to tie his men to the ship, uh, to this little boat. I'll show you with some pictures you can look at later. Uh, to keep him from going overboard. He knew if he, because it would come back. It was only self-bailing. It was, it popped back up. What's that? Uh, self bailing exactly, okay. self writing Now, <laughs> some of this was around World War II, wasn't it? That was around World War II. So we had a whole lot of activity off of here. A lot of activity. They'd go out and stay sometimes all day and all night. If they got a survivor that was in bad shape, they had to come back in, you know, and uh, those, those type of things. Uh, I do remember a funny thing he told me. Uh, they picked up survivors that couldn't speak a word of English, and um, in their pocket was a ticket from a Broadway show in New York City about a week before. And I thought that was neat, you know. Now well, they one were, extreme to the and, other. They went yeah, from New York to Kitty Hawk. <laughs> New York, and they had been on the submarine and out here. Oh, amazing, that, that, amazing. That. Uh, Kathleen, we'll get back to you. Uh, Sam, uh, we got Sam Beecham with us tonight. Uh, I was just amazed to know that before there was a duck in North Carolina that was actually called Kathy's Inlet. And... Uh, I mean, I think everybody in the room has known that uh, Sanderling uh, Restaurant and Spa up there is actually uh, parts of, at least the profile, I guess, of the old Caffey's Inlet Station. But, you know, <clears throat> the Outer Banks has just seen change upon change upon change. It's been almost phenomenal. It's been exponential change. It's been change on top of change. But I would dare say that Duck has probably undergone the biggest metamorphosis of, uh, of any of our uh, municipalities or towns or villages here on the Outer Banks. Sam, uh, I guess your father was in the Coast Guard up there as well, and you pretty much, uh, up until your early teens, you were there at Kathy's Inlet? Yeah, I grew up there. Mm -hmm. I went there. I don't remember going there. I was so young, and I stayed there until I was uh, 16 years old. Okay. Use your mic. Yeah. <laughs> then uh, we moved to Kitty Hawk, and Dad was moved from there to uh, Virginia Beach. And what was his name? Walter. Walter Beecham. Okay, and your grand your grandfather, I think you told me one time, was in actually in the old life saving service. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Would you remember his name? Yeah, John. Okay. All right. Uh, was he still alive when you were? When you yeah, were? I remember him. I don't remember him in the in the service. He was retired when I remember. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, tell me a little bit about. Uh, you know, up there at Cat, where, where was the station? Was it right there where the restaurant? No, it's, it's sitting right where it is now, where the restaurant is. That okay. was the station. Okay. They just added on to it and made, I guess, bigger or something. I don't know what they done to it. Well, you could probably just about throw a baseball from one body of water to the other back then, couldn't you? Or was there a whole lot of beach out front there? Not much more than it is today. It was a little, I think some of the east side is gone, but the west side is about the same as it was. Right. You could probably see from body of water to body of water, though. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. easily. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, even when one of the uh, oh, 33 storms, the storm the water came over, and it, at, right at high tide, you could not see no land there. It was just coming right on across and going in the sign. And you were in the station? In the station, yeah. They moved all the families over there. You know. Put you upstairs? Well, we, were staying, we were living all over the place there because there was quite a crowd there then. <laughs> Well, uh, I know you had some friends that you grew up there with. I think you mentioned some of the tollers and yeah, some, Bill and Sidney Toller. Right. And well, my my older brother, which was two years older than I am. Well, what would y'all do to occupy yourselves up there? Did uh, your dad let you? Did would he give you boys guns? Did y'all hunt? Yeah, we we hunted, fished, and uh, worked the gardens. That was an uh, ongoing thing all the time. We cut wood. We burnt wood for our heat. Um, we stayed busy, but we, we had a lot of fun. The uh, the gardens there, I guess, uh, I mean, you know, gardens are a lot of fun today, but back then it was a necessity. Uh, that's where you got your food. A yeah, lot right. Well, where the gardens were up there was just north of where the station is, and there was a strip of land right between, <clears throat> excuse me, where the 
<coughs> y'all excuse me, uh, right from where the road is to the marsh, there was a streak in there that was real rich ground. I don't know why, I guess it were water grass had washed up there for years and rotted. Mm -hmm. But that's where everybody had a garden in there. And uh, we raised a lot of food there. Can you net, what, uh, what, cabbage, uh, collards? Uh... Just about anything. You can raise cabbage, peas, beans, and uh, the whole bit. Was there a fence around it? Oh yeah, you had to have a fence because it was cows was running all over the place. They 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 get the garden before y'all did, huh? Right. <laughs> yeah. Can uh, you know? I, I guess uh, you know your dad and uh, the other people. Around, I know it was a close knit family, but uh, I guess they had you in there pulling weeds. They had you planting. Uh, uh, can you give us just a little overview of uh, some of your gardening duties? <laughs> Yeah, back in them days when you had uh, onions in your garden, you got down on your hands and knees and picked the grass out from around there, all that mess, and uh, done a lot of hoeing, and just cleaning it up, putting manure from the, from the chicken house and the stables, had to go in the garden, and all that mess. So. That's the highlight of your day, I'm oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, tell, tell me, you told me a story, uh, and, uh, and forgive me, I might have gotten this wrong, but uh, something was going on in the garden there. There's some chickens running around in there or something, and one of the Toller boys uh, had had enough of that and uh, evidently uh, went and got a gun. And well, yeah, we had uh, field peas growing out there, and they'd gotten up pretty high, the chickens would get in there, and you couldn't see them. And they were eating them peas pretty fast, and uh and my dad told us to keep the chickens out, so we kept running them out, running them out, and they wouldn't go out. So anyway, we went up there one day with a shotgun and just shot down through the weeds. And, and <laughs> I don't know how many chickens we killed, but it was a bunch of chickens out there. Yeah. <laughs> there are there's, there's feathers everywhere. Yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, they kind of broke them out a little bit, but they still tried to get in there. <laughs> Did you get in trouble? No, we didn't know. We took them in the marsh and, and hit them back there. Had fried chicken the next day. Where'd you get these chickens? You don't want to know. Uh, Kathleen, let's uh, get back to you a little bit. Uh, you showed me something. I came by to see you there at the Cavalier. It, it's amazing to me that, uh, you know, having grown up there and you have not gotten very far away from home to be working right there at the Cavalier. Still in, that's the truth. Still in the same neighborhood. No, that's admirable. It really is. But you showed me something. I've had the darndest time trying to find out what it is. But there's been a whole bunch of other people finding these things lately. It's like a little cotton ball, and it's got a sand dollar kind of imprint in the sea biscuit. Sea biscuit. Thank you. I mean, if you smell it, it smells like a crab pot. There's a crab in there. All right. See little crab legs in it, couldn't you? Sea biscuit. One of the guests brought that in that day to me, and I said I've never seen anything like it. Never. So we went from there. When you came in behind me. Sea biscuit. That's pretty rich. That's a that's a great description. Okay. Well, we've uh, I've learned something. I've been here for 49 years. And I've learned something. Uh, Kathleen, uh, you know, I, I want to ask you some more about uh, you know just your father there. Uh, that was a beautiful building, and I, I, I'm not here to point fingers or anything, but I don't know how that station ever got away from us. Uh, did, what what happened? Did, I killed him. Oh, I don't know. That it, it should have been preserved. <laughs> it was really us. It, it was a, a nice station. But of course, that land and everything, that was the bomb track. And okay. uh, it was yeah. to go back to the bombs when the Coast Guard was through with it, mm -hmm. which is what it did. And, um, and then um, it could have been preserved, but it would have had to have been moved. Right. That is what I understood. So I truly don't know. I don't know. I was disappointed. Right. Well, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Uh, speaking from my own experience down there in uh, Buxton, uh, where the Fessenden Center is, which is our older adults and youth center, uh, there was actually one of the buildings left over, which housed the generator for Reginald Fessenden. And there was a lot of, I mean, Lee DeForest, the guy who was instrumental in the development of uh, television, was actually one of Marconi's uh, employees. A anyway, long story short, uh, when, when the county, when we all... Uh, uh, built the Fessenden Center down there. The first thing they tore down was that building. We thought it was a public health waiting room for the old public health hospital there right after World War II, which might not be that significant. And it was a public health waiting room, but before that it was dated to 1903. And those kind of things, they just kind of get away from us. But now, I, I think now we know 
uh, what not to run a bulldozer through and, and, and what to and what not to. Uh, Kathleen, I, I'd like to spend a little more time with you talking about, uh, you had some really neat pictures uh, to show us. Uh, I think at one time uh, there was a dog that you uh, that y'all had around the station. I believe the uh, animal's name was Nora. And was that was that? an organ inlet. Okay, it's organ inlet. Can you tell us tell us a little bit? You've got a picture over here, and I'll pass it around a little bit. And hopefully, yeah, I've got it right now. Okay. But um, yeah, now that was a story Dad told me that was a and I and there's pictures of the dog coming in and bringing him this uh, sailor cat, but. Um, this, uh, they, the sailor, they had a lot of, um, you know, training. Men came there for training and everything. A lot of sailors went through uh, organ and also Kitty Hawk back then. But um, these boys were going out on, uh, on their patrol, you mm -hmm. know, down to, uh, I think they had a little place that they locked in, didn't they? That they had to go clock in. Mm -hmm. Then they met from one station to the other station in the middle you know, going between these stations. So he was on his uh, patrol that night, and um, here came this, uh, and, the, and their mascot, Norrell, went with him, or either was right behind him. Just kind of like a mutt dog, an old Yeah, just dog. a little old dog that one of them brought in, a little stray fella, and, uh, and he came in and brought this boy's cap. And, uh, of course, immediately they went to look for him. He had passed out. It was a very, very cold, the coldest of weather, a really bad time. And they really, and they brought him in and of course had him shipped right off to the hospital and he survived. But had it not been for Nora, they would not have gone to look for him until he had made his trip and walked all the way back. Time for that. And then they would have been to question it and have gone out and looked for him. But they doubt seriously he could ever have survived it, had it not been for Nora. That's an amazing story. Yeah, we've we've got a picture of it up here. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not sure yeah. where it came from. It was actually a printed story, but it shows a picture of the dog with the sailor's hat in his mouth. And I believe it was your father. Yeah, he was hand. I mean, and Dad was taking it out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. Amazing. But uh, we'll pass that around here in a little bit. Uh, Bill, let's get back to you a little bit. Uh, you know, you spent a lot of time uh, with the Wright brothers and... Uh, you and I have talked and uh, about you know just one of the some of the things that attracted the Wright brothers here, and I think we kind of take for granted today that yes, indeed the wind blew. We knew that Bill Tate said that uh, this is you'll find a lot of wind here, and that uh, we've got all the isolation you need. We all know that the Wright brothers didn't want uh, a whole lot of prying eyes, so to speak. But I, I really got to believe that. Uh, there's something else that they attracted to Wright Brothers here, and I think it had to do with the uh, the hospitality of the people. I think they felt like they were going to find a uh, people here who would help them, and people here who would uh, actually make a contribution. Is that pretty much? Well, that's. I think it's very true. Uh, of course, they didn't know the people here when they um, when they came, but uh, they became friends with uh, the local people and. Um, uh, Bill Tate, as an example, was a friend with Orville Wright until Orville died in 1948. Uh, he went up to Dayton on several occasions for ceremonies and so forth. Um, I think the people in Kitty Hawk, um, they thought the Wrights were a little strange, but they didn't, um, they didn't put them down for what they were doing. Uh, the Wrights, when they first came here, they lived with uh, uh, Bill Tate and, and Addie. In, in their house. In fact, there's a picture over here on the wall of uh, Captain Bill Tate and Miss Addie, their children, and um, uh, a neighbor, Nancy Baum, and a dog named Spot. Now, you wouldn't think I knew that, except that I asked Mr. Truxton Midget. Well, he was telling me who the people were, and I said, well, and I was kind of being a smart aleck, and I said, well, what's the name of the dog? He said, Spot. <laughs> so, uh, I, and, and if you look at him, he's got a spot, a black spot over his eye. But anyway, the Tates were particularly close to uh, Wilbur Nova Wright, but others became close to him too. Uh, Franklin Harris Midget uh, ran the Lou Willis, a uh, freight boat from Elizabeth City to, to Kitty Hawk, and brought the Wrights down a lot of time, went and got their material and, uh, and would bring that back to them. Sometimes the Wright had to pay him a little extra to get the special trip, but, but nevertheless, he, um, they did that. Uh, 
the rights even stayed at uh, Franklin Harris, uh, uh, Harris Midget was his name, or uh, locally how he was called, Harris Midget, and they actually stayed in their home in, in the village of Kitty Hawk. So, uh, and I was talking to Aunt Mary Midget, who was the Franklin Harris's uh, wife, and uh, I said, what, what, what do you, can you tell me about the rights? And she said, well, that, um, that Wilbur was very uh, studious and, 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 and really didn't have much to say. She said, but, but Orwell was f uh, full of fun, is how she explained it. So, but I, I think uh, the people here in Kitty Hawk um, uh, thought a lot of the rights. They respected what they were doing. They didn't interfere with what they were doing. The rights actually uh, hired people to do things for them. Dan Tate was a, uh, they hired him to help them, so he is in a lot of the early pictures until 1904, and he went on strike. And he was, Orville was explained to his sister that some of um, Dan Tate's friends had caught a lot of fish, and he wanted the rights to increase his salary, and they wouldn't do it, so he, he went on strike to go fishing with the, um, uh, with the local boys. Unfortunately, An that's- An honorable thing. <laughs> unfortunately, you know, fish run in cycles, and his cycle ran out quickly, so... Uh, he came back to the rights with hat in hand, didn't he? <laughs> that was not a very smart thing. Uh, the rights, after, they lived with uh, the taste for about uh, a month, and then they moved up on the sand hill and uh, had a tent up there. And it was said, and of course the, the rights claimed that uh, they were um, almost devoured by mosquitoes, <laughs> and uh, they didn't have any water, so they washed their their pans and stuff out with sand. They just rubbed sand in there to get rid of the grease and stuff and then wiped it out. Um, but after a heavy wind, people would kind of come out and see if, they, if that tent was still standing, just to <laughs> see what the boys were doing. But um, I, I think overall the people, in, and, and they came, even after they moved down to Killowa Hills, they still came back to Kitty Hawk because that was the post office, and they were they sent and received a lot of mail, comparatively. So that's why the locals would see them at the post office or coming through the village going to their camp. Well, here, hearing you talk about this, then uh, you know uh, we kind of take for granted everything that's out here on the beach, but pretty much the transportation avenue was more shore road. You talk about trucks and midget and. I guess all these, the Tates, they were all along Moore Shore Road, is that, is that correct? Well, uh, the Tates lived on what, it, what we call Moore Shore Road. Uh, the uh, Midgets lived, uh, well, they lived kind of back in the, not in the center of the community, but in the center of the east part of the community, if I okay. put it that way. All right. Uh, I've got a picture here, Bill. I want you to take a look at uh, Mildred Foreman gave it to me. Uh, we wanted Mildred to come be a part of things tonight, but you know she just hadn't been feeling that well lately and respectfully declined. And if I knew her better, I'd have pushed her, but uh, I respected that. But she gave me that picture. She actually gave me a whole lot of pictures. I went there to just have a 15 minute chat and it was darn near dark uh, <laughs> when I left. And you know, she's really- That's the menu, Brian. That's the old, the, up top's the old Dijkstra's Canal. The, or, uh, the, top, the top picture is a postcard and it's of uh, the Dykster, uh, uh, well, I guess you call it marina today, but- It's uh, the original Oregon Inlet Fishing Center, but it's, so it's, to speak. Right, and the boat just coming in to the, um, to the, the uh, boat basin is the um, Mildred L, I think, I'm not mm -hmm. sure. It's, anyway, it's uh, her dad's boat. He was one of the early uh, party boat captains uh, okay. in, in um, uh, out of out of Dijkster's and then later out of Organellet. The bottom picture is also a postcard. It was taken about 1960, I think, and it shows the Moore Shore Road along the um, uh, along the bayfront there, right in Kitty Hawk. This one right here. We'll never see that again. No, but fortunately, uh, the town of Kitty Hawk does have a uh, a trail, uh, a bike trail and walkway along a portion of that, so that at least that part would be saved. But up until the roads came here in the, in the Outer Banks, which was in 1930 and 32, um, 
the, everybody went by these uh, these dirt roads, and that was the main road from Nags Head all the way to uh, well, all the way to Cabas Inlet and all the way up to Corolla. So it was an inside road that uh, was used by everybody uh, who came went north and south. They didn't go out on the beach much because you uh, it was too soft. Well, that, that's one of the thing. One of the many things uh, we've all learned from David is that. Uh, when the roads went in, uh, I can speak more from experience down in Hatteras, but uh, a lot of the old timers said, look, you're building that road out there on the ocean. That's where all the energy is. You're just asking for trouble. And pretty much the state engineers, the DOT engineers at that time, y'all stick to your nets, we'll build the road. But we've been saying all along to build over there on the sound side, on the shore side, because once the water comes up, you can wait a few hours and that water will go back down out there on the ocean you're going to be picking up pieces of asphalt on a regular basis and it's pretty much happened that way but you know it, it does kind of under, underscore that uh you know th this is just a beautiful picture I'd i wish we could get it bigger and i'll give it to chris here we're going to put all this on dvd and uh go ahead and bury it but hopefully it'll be running on channel 20 once chris works his magic and <laughs> he makes us all look like geniuses thank god and uh but uh you know Bill, I want to ask you some more about, uh, you know, just there's been an awful lot of changes here, and, and thank goodness that you've been talking to a lot of people and keeping a lot of a lot of this going. But I, I guess you know, can you can you just kind of illuminate some of the some of the biggest changes that you you think we've had here? I know the names have changed. You've got to be 75 percent of the people here now weren't living here, you know, 30, 35 years ago. What's some of the changes that you can? you know, outside of development. Uh. Uh, before I tell you that, can, can I tell you about it? You mentioned names. Uh, I don't think Kathleen even knows this, but her father's name, Thomas Jefferson um, Harris, and, and, uh, and they called him Jep. And he was named for the keeper of the Paul Gables, I mean, of the Pennies Hill Station. Her Way name was Thomas Jefferson uh, Tillett. Anyway, uh, Uncle Jep's uh, father joined the life saving service, and his name was Sylvanius Harris. So he went to sign up, and, uh, and, and Thomas Jefferson, the, the keeper, said, Well, what's your middle name? He says, I don't have one. Well, every, everybody has one. No, I don't have one. He said, Well, I'll give you one. So he gave him a name, Valeris. So he became Sylvanius Valeris Harris, <laughs> and they called him Veen. So that's uh, that's a little bit of your your your, your dad's uh, uh, background. Now you asked about the uh, biggest change that I've seen. Of course, Sam is older than I am, so he wouldn't see bigger changes. But I he's think holding I, up well. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Kathleen might be a little older than I am. I'm not going to say that. You know, <laughs> I just there'll be no bloodshed here tonight. <laughs> But anyway, the big, the single biggest change. I, I, I'm going to lose two cousins here. <laughs> That's right. We are all related. Uh, the 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 single biggest change that I have seen is the growth of vegetation uh, between the dunes and, and 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 the village, and that was caused by up until. 19, until the early 1930s, uh, livestock and particularly sheep were allowed to run loose here on the Outer Banks and they were, it was kind of an open range and they had, they would have um, uh, uh, sheep pendants particularly once a year. Usually the day after the life saving service closed for the season, which would be like June the 1st. But the, the livestock and the uh, and particularly the sheep just kept the uh, vegetation clip, clipped down so close that that's why you had all the blowing sand. And that's why you had the fences. It wasn't to keep anything in, it was to keep those, the mm -hmm. cattle and stuff out of the garden, not into the... Exactly right. The kids could go anywhere. They, they wanted to keep the animals out of the garden. Yeah, but so, so I think if, if I had to say one significant change, I believe it's the vegetation. No. You can see, well, we've had a lot of uh, building, and that's uh, true. But I think the vegetation is the one that impresses me anyway. Amazing. Well, you would have that perspective. And, uh, you know, there, there's an awful lot of sand up here. If you could remove these 
buildings and the bypass and the asphalt and, and a lot of that vegetation, I think it would really put in perspective about how much beach really used to be out here. Yeah, yeah. Well, Sam, uh, I want to get back to you. Uh, uh, we talked a little bit about your Coast Guard background. I guess you kind of knew all along there with your, you know, your ancestors and stuff, life-saving service, and that it's going to be the Coast Guard for you. Uh, well, not really. I, okay. I, uh, what got me in there was the war started. And, uh, uh, Pearl Harbor was bummed. Can you hear me? Pearl Harbor was bummed my senior year in high school. And so as soon as I graduated, I enlisted. And I don't think I had really made up my mind to go in the Coast Guard, but I did. I went in and stayed during that. And, uh, well, if you didn't go in the Coast Guard, somebody else was going to get you. That was pretty much. That was it. Yeah. Uh, well, can you t can you just just uh, can you give us an idea of what uh, you you left here? Where, where'd you go? Norfolk. Uh, well, I enlisted in Norfolk, and then I went to uh, Baltimore to boot camp for five weeks, and uh, went to New London, Connecticut, and from there I went to uh, I was there about three weeks, and I went to Miami, Florida, and they sent me down there by myself on a train, and anyway. I got down there, they picked me up at the railroad station, carried me over to the hotel I was to stay in. And I, on the way down, I said, well, I'm going to get away from Sam. I've been Sam all my life, and it's not even part of my name. What and is your I, name? Alvis. Alvis. Alvis Gold? Alvis Gold. Okay. And anyway, so I've been Sam all my life. But anyway, uh, I said, I'm going to get away from that, because nobody here knows me. So I got down there, and I got off of the elevator on the hotel they put me in on the seventh floor and I stepped off of that thing on my seat bag and somebody down the hall said, hey Sam! <laughs> it was Lionel Shannon's from over here. Hey Mike, I mean that's a long way away for Kitty Hawk boy. And <laughs> you, you can't get away from your roots. <laughs> anyway, so I stayed Sam most of the time I was in the Coast Guard. Boy, that's funny. That's hilarious. Uh, what did you do uh, outside? I know uh, once y'all got away from uh, Kathy's Inlet and got back in here, uh, back in the village and stuff. Uh, how'd you occupy your time? I guess your friends really did change. There were still the Tollers, there were still some of your cousins, the Perrys, and the, uh, did, did, you, did you hunt? Did y'all do a lot of fishing? Uh, yeah, well, that was, you know, fun, but we, that wasn't a where we made our living. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, no, I was an equipment operator, making my living. Right, right. Well, uh, <clears throat> Tell us a little bit about, uh, well, okay, by the time you got out of Caffey's Inlet, I mean, it was two, three, four years later, you were in the Coast Guard. Right, yeah. Okay, all right, okay. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, back there in Kitty Hawk Land, and uh, you, you, it's a, just a beautiful area back in there, but I think at one time, you know, if we could go back 50, 60 years ago and see what's in there today, I don't think anybody would recognize it. Oh, no, no, it wouldn't. Okay. Was there what, what was back there? Was it just woods? Uh, woods and marsh and mm -hmm. swamp, everything. Mosquitoes. Oh yeah, they were there. <laughs> yeah, snakes. Yeah, my oldest son. The first day he went to school, he he got just about a third of the way out, and the mosquitoes got so bad he run back to the house. And my wife carried him to school back to the school bus. Is that Mike or Ricky? <laughs> that was Mike. Okay, all right. <laughs> Well, you showed me a picture of the old uh, Kitty Hawk school bus, and I got looking at that thing. It was like right out of the Beverly, Beverly Hillbillies. As a matter of fact, Jethro Clamp would have been proud of that, that old Kitty Hawk school bus. But, uh, you know, uh, I think that might have been a few years before your time, but you, you told me a little story about the bus driver. Uh, was he, he was a relative? Yeah, he's, uh, that was Tom Beach. I mean, he lived at our house and drove that school bus. It was a, that was the last year they used it. Well, the next year that I started school, they had a brand new Model A Ford school bus. And uh, they did away with that old... That air conditioning? <laughs> yeah, the old windows in that thing hinged down from the top, and they would go like that when you were going over the ruts. <laughs> well, I, I, I kind of got a kick out of you know some of the stories you were telling me about where they, they would go into Virginia with it, actually drove the thing to Raleigh. Was, yeah. My gosh, that was an excursion. <laughs> Uh, could they do it in the day, as far as you know? Or? Could they? Yeah. Uh, no, I think they'd run them off the road now. <laughs> yeah, that had to have been the, uh, yeah. to go from uh, Kitty Hawk to Raw or up Curry Tug. Is that, is that the way they would go up toward Elizabeth City? Yeah, they'd go through Curry Tug, Elizabeth City. Yeah. Right that way. What we know today is 158 or, uh, yeah, 158. Yeah, yeah, 158. Yeah, well, no, it went 158 
uh, from the Little City on up was 17 and 64. Okay, all right, okay. Uh, <clears throat> did, were you uh, old enough to, was the, the bridge uh, from Curry Tuck over to uh, Kitty Hawk there, the bridge we know now today is a four lane bridge and uh, bringing, you know, legitimately millions, millions, a uh, couple of million people here. Was it was that, that bridge there when you were? No, born? no, I remember when they built the first bridge across there. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Was it after the Depression or uh, World War II ish? Oh, oh no, it was way before that. Oh. Uh, I wasn't too old, but I well remember it because we used to go out there on the Sunday evenings, everybody getting a boat and go out there and see what they were doing and all. But, uh, it was 23, 20, in the late 20s. Right, that was a big, that must have been a big project. I, I think we kind of take for granted being able to shoot across that bridge as quick as, as, quick as it was, but that, that was a haul. Yeah. That was a lot of water to cover. And they had a draw, it was a, a toll on that bridge then, too. Mm -hmm. You had to pay a toll it when you got to the draw. You had to stop and pay the man who lived there in the little house. I had to pay him to get across. Wow. Well, Bill, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, some of your experiences growing up. Uh, I, I guess you you had a chance to go to college. Uh, got out of here fairly early, or yeah, I did. But I'd rather hear Sam's story. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I drew a blank there. Bill, let me. Let me can I you expand on, on something? That here, Sam, take my mic. That Sam uh, was talking about is the school bus. The first school bus was a uh, was well, it was a truck. It was multi truck. And then they put a body on the back of it so the students could sit inside. And, and it didn't have um, windows that had curtains that rolled down and, and rolled up. Well, that's the one I and, really and, had there, yeah. Pardon? That was the one that they drove up there. That, that okay. That, that school bus, I, I went back and um, I went through the uh, Board of Education records. That school bus had been at East Lake. And the problem with East Lake was that there's so much mud that they, were, they, they spent all their time pushing that bus and they got <laughs> tired of it. And so they asked to give that bus up. And so the school, superintendent of schools said, well, bring it to Manio. And, and the people in East Lake wanted a boat to get their students to, so they bought them a boat to get the students to school and <laughs> Kitty, Kitty Hawk ended up with that school bus. Well, by the time Kitty Hawk got it, it had, they pretty much ruined it by uh, the transmission was no good, the engine was no good because they just revving it up going through the sand, I mean uh, the mud. So anyway, Kitty Hawk got the school bus. And um, so they had to repair it the first thing before they even could use it. Well, the next thing you do, Tom Beecham was living up with your family, I believe, yeah. up at Cavas Inlet, and he was a school bus driver. So. They go up, but when the tide came in, they'd have to go on the sand. And when they did, they ended up pushing that bus about as much as the people at East Lake pushed the yeah, bus the wore out. They pushed it to the, to the sand. But uh, the, and then later, of course, they, they had a second school bus, and then, then as, they, as, as Sam said, they had Model A and then, then other vehicles as well. That, that school bus, incidentally, was uh, used by the uh, boys in 1927, I believe, or maybe 28, and they took a trip all the way across the, the state to uh, to Tennessee. And I'm skeptical. Yeah, yeah, they did, and of course they. Uh, I have a picture. I have some pictures of that school bus, and they had extra tires hung on the side, <laughs> and and they had water jugs, and they had their camping gear is up in top, and they had a, a boot on the back, you know, to carry some of their mm -hmm. stuff. And they went across, they were gone for, I think, three weeks. They weren't going to be gone that long, but they caught, uh, some of the boys got mumps when they were over in the <laughs> western part of the state, and they had to wait until that mumps got through before they could go on and, and come back. But Tom Beecham was one of the drivers. He and Orville Baum were the two drivers that, that carried these uh, high school kids. And the reason they did that was the principal at the time was a fellow by the name of Alton Baum from over in Fairfield area. And he wanted the boys to see <coughs> um, the colleges and, and you know see if he could interest them in going to college. And, and some of them did. That honorable thing, yeah. So, mm. so that was a reason for the bus trip. Mm. It wasn't just for fun. Well, I wonder if they had a dog in the back. <laughs> <laughs>
don't think Spock went with me. <laughs> well, uh, Kathleen, uh, I know that, uh, you know, I, I know you girls and your friends and Jeanette and everything, uh, you know, there from the Stop and Shop area. It was it was pretty good haul over there to uh, Kill Double Hill. Y'all, what, what did y'all, would you, Give me an idea of a day excursion. What did you do? Did you go have picnics? Did you go to Nags Ed Woods? Well, let, me, let me tell you one thing that happened when I was a little bitty girl. Um, of course, like I said, Dad was at the station. Captain Lou Hart was in charge. But that terrible storm that we had in the 30s, when it came through, Oh, I remember them coming. I, I, I just remember. I, I remember everyone went to the Coast Guard station. Everybody, mm -hmm. almost from Kitty Hawk to Kill Devil, went to the Coast Guard station. They went around and told them. And when it was all, when the storm was over, I remember the fun. It was. I thought it was so exciting. We all had to get in this little boat, and they took us home. And the water, and only time in my lifetime that I can remember that the ocean tide was over on the highway. Of course, it was just the one highway, that one little highway, in that, all the way from Kildare, all the way through. But it was covered with seawater, uh, ocean water. And we went down that, that road to our houses and got out And when I was little back then. You know. What were you, what, maybe seven, eight, nine? Uh... I was, so uh, that was in the 30s. Um, <laughs> You weren't even born yet, were you? Oh, I hardly was born. <laughs> oh, dear gosh, I have a birthday this month. You're getting bad. Gracious. Uh, I, but that, uh, it, it was maybe um, in 30, I was little. I, I was little. I can hardly remember any of it. I don't know really how much of it I remember and how much of it I look at a picture and remember it being told, you know, but I, I, uh, I, Seems like I can remember being with Daddy and in that little boat. Well, what, what, what was Kill Devil Hill like? Uh, was it have a lot of grass on it? Was it just a lot of blowing sand? Was that little pine grove between the highway and the hill there? Or uh, well, there now behind uh, our house was made uh, was built from an old the old boathouse at Kill Devil Hill when they decided to have uh, build a new uh, boathouse at the station. Uh, Dad, he must have bought that. And it was long enough for three bedrooms, and I, he doubled it. And that was my house, and was always my I always had a home in Kildare Hills, and that was it. And then he just added a little bit to it. Had a porch all the way around the, um, the west side and the uh, south side. But um, that is where my home came from, it was the, the old Coast Guard life, uh, the boat. House. Well, what, what, would, what would you girls but do? Did, there was sorry. a big hill behind our house when they, wherever they chose to build this, uh, there was a big hill behind our house. Do you remember that, Bill? Uh, I was too young. Oh. <laughs> uh, <there> was, <laughs> and it had those seaweeds on it. It was just full of them, you know. But I guess it was a protection, too, you know. And, um, and Jeanette and I played, and we just played with in sand. I remember we had a pump out there, and her dad and my dad had a, they were building a big barn behind their houses. And we had those barns for playhouses for almost two summers, it seems to me like. I, I remember, and we'd go out there and, and with that pump, and we would make mud pies and just have the best time. And, and we ate, finally had our tables and chairs and buggies with our babies. And, we just had a good time, but as we grew older, um, then we would walk over. It was a big thing to walk to the monument. That was a day's outing. You go on a picnic. You go over to the monument. You had a picnic before you got there, and you were tired. It was such a long walk, and then you had a picnic before you started home that evening. But uh, that was big. There was about four of us girls, I think, that would get out and walk to the monument and do things like that. Walk the beach, look for shells, and sea biscuits. Uh, yeah, I didn't Thank ever you. find a sea biscuit. But um, but then and then when I was growing up, well, Elton and Irene Twyford's store was the store on the beach, and I got to work in it when I was in high school last in the summers. That store was the grocery store. It was uh, the post office and a big drug store. It had a fountain in it. I mean, I thought it was big. And um, 
ice cream. You could go there. And, of course, there were a lot of sailors at the station then, training and things. And that's where they spend a lot of their time, in that, in the uh, trading post right now. Uh, it's, wow. Okay. It's the trading post. And they spent a lot of time back then there. Just, just to put put this in perspective, you talk about your house that your dad had. I know he had a lot of skills. You, you had to be able to do a little bit of everything. Right. I think, in. you know, men did, used to do that. <laughs> yeah, nowadays you can't get them off the couch. <laughs> uh, but where was that house? Was it was it on the ocean side of oh, it's the there bypass? Now. Oh, that house okay. has been kept well. Whoever uh, uh, has it now has kept it well. It's uh, right behind Colony 4. Uh, it's catty-cornered. Those lots were catty-cornered. Why, I could not tell you. But the Colony 4 is kind of catty-cornered. Well, our house, the house I grew up in, was always my home, is sort of behind, straight to the street. Colony 4 has a little lattice work over in one corner. And my daddy had lattice work over on that corner. That was called the back porch. I'm wondering if it's the same lattice work. <laughs> Could be. Uh, I guarantee you about... Uh, but, Ten uh, times in value. But, but that house is still there. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, <clears throat> tell me a little bit about Nags Head Woods. I, I think sometimes the bypass kind of throws everybody off. You know, when I think of Nags Head Woods, you've got to go all the way down to where McDonald's is and uh, run down Ocean Acres. But I guess you girls could go right on down to Collington Road and get over around Run Hill and go in that way. And that's what we did. We'd go picnicking on... And they called it Nags Head Woods. That's what we called. We were going over to Nags Head Woods for the day and picnic. And uh, But I then later wondered, was that Nags Head Woods? You reckon we were on that hill, you know, run, that, what is it, run hill? Run hill, run was, hill yeah, thing, yeah, huh? yeah eating the woods. And if, it, if that's true, Nags Head, all those hills must come back pretty close to yeah, a beautiful area. Mm -hmm. You know, we can really only get a concept. Uh, we, mm -hmm. we can't go back and get those days back. It's fortunately good people like yourselves that can give us an idea. But, you know, to be able to fly over this area. Did any of you Did any of you have the privilege of being young and able to fly? Uh, I mean, Dave Driscoll, for instance, uh, the old Park Service pilot, used to come down to Hatteras. But did, was there ever an airstrip behind the monument? Did any of you as kids get a chance? Just, just, I'm just asking. Not that I know of. Okay. Right. I, I'm not aware of it. The, the, highest but, I ever, the highest I ever got in Kitty Hawk was climbing the, um, uh, the tower that was built during the war for the radar that was right where the Catholic Church is now. And uh, you could, uh, before they took all the bolts off of it, you could climb that, uh, uh, climb up that. And I, I don't know how tall that was. Shelby, you have any idea how tall that tower was? It's, it's, but when you grow up in Kitty Hawk, being at ground level, 145 feet, it feels like you're in the air. Well, you could probably see a big part of the map. Uh, you know, kind of just Roanoke Sound and Croatan, but you can see the Albemarle and the North River, and that was, must have been quite a quite a quite a perspective on the map of our region. To, yeah. One thing, looking down, I would think, honestly, Kitty Hawk, so much erosion. Short I mean, side when we think side. about, you know, the or station both. and everything was way okay. on the other side. And, and when I would come to visit with my granddaddy up here, we had a long walk to go to the ocean. Oh, <laughs> past the road, you know. <laughs> I guess I was little. And, but now in Kill Devil, it's not so much that way. Because the Coast Guard station, uh, it still has a good bit of good land behind beach. it yeah. down there yeah. around... Um, the Cavalier behind the Cavalier and all. I, it doesn't seem like it's changed all that much. I remember the Coast Guard station had a um, big tower that was not as it was at the end, you know, in the station, at the top of the station. It was a big tower off from the Coast Guard station back there. That was a treat to get to go up the tower. I don't think we were supposed to. And uh, get to go up there and just really look up and down the beach. It was amazing, you know. Well, Sam, uh, I want to ask you a little bit more. I know uh, you're from a tight-knit family. Uh, I know your boys, and they're all just wonderful. I've had the privilege of knowing Tim for a long time. But uh, tell me a little bit about your family when you were growing up. I, I guess y'all were, uh, how many brothers did you have? Tight-knit family? or? Yeah, I'm in the middle of three boys. Okay, any girls in there? No. Boy, I bet your mother had it rough. No, we watched dishes too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, uh, uh, whereabouts, uh, where, 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 was, where was your old home place? And uh, I know you got out of Caffey's Inlet. Well, you had a home place in the village then still, didn't you? Even when you were up at Caffey's Inlet? No, when we lived at Caffey's Inlet, we, we had a home there, and that was okay. it. Okay, all right. And, uh, our house was exactly east, I mean west of the Coast Guard Station up there, right okay. on the sign. Okay. Our backyard went right in the water. What about in the village here? When y'all relocated back in the village uh, or came to the village, where, where was the old home place? Oh, uh, the old humpback bridge over in the village. Okay. The, the first house on to the right, kind of high porch around all the way around the front of it. That was my father built that. When they changed the law, you had to take your stock up. He had a bunch of cows running loose. And uh, when he had to take them up and sell them, he, he built that house with the money he got out of that. Okay. What, uh, I guess we've talked a little bit about Moore Shore Road and everything, but uh, it's my understanding that Kitty Hawk Woods Road that comes out there where Kitty Hawk Elementary, but that, that's obviously an old tra transportation route, so right, to speak. Uh, yeah. Y'all cross into what is now Southern Shores uh, through that area? That's well, that was, the, uh, yeah, that was always just called the main road, and, and that was the one everybody used. Uh, the only other way was what they called the pole road, where you went up where the telephone poles was on the beach. Mm -hmm. uh, you better let the air out of your tires go on that road, hadn't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sam, tell them about your, your days as a basketball player. You done, you, you done said it all. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did uh, Duke or uh, Chapel, did Tar Heels offer yeah. your scholarship or anything? Well, see, we, uh, the basketball court was sand. There was, yeah, that's none, that's none, what none I was trying to get there. at. Yeah, it was just sand. You couldn't dribble the ball. You had to pass the ball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, of course, when the people came to play Well, now, we Sam, had them a little bit then. We could pass the ball, but we could not dribble it. Yeah. We went away from here. They tore us up. When, when, they, when, they, uh, when they came to Kitty Hawk to play, the boys in Kitty Hawk had the advantage mm -hmm. because these other kids had basketball courts or they had compact sand or whatever. But when it came to Kitty Hawk, they, they had that soft sand, and and the boys in Kitty Hawk could, uh, could whip them. Yeah. <laughs> well, Sam, Sam, tell us a little. There's got to be a story in here somewhere. Uh, who, ca who came up to town here and got their butts kicked pretty good in basketball? Was it, what was it? How about Manio? Did they ever come to visit y'all? Yeah, we played Manio, Curry Tuck. Oh, oh. What the heck was the name of that school up? Weeksville. Okay. And, uh, Probably a Nixon something or another. Yeah, we went to... Uh, Say again, Chelsea? South Mill. Yeah, okay. South Mill. Yeah, played different places. Yeah. How about? Did you ever beat Mania? Oh, uh, over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about when you went over there? No. <laughs> All right. Did you leave mad? Yeah. I, when I was in high school, we never beat Mania the whole time we were up here. My right, guys, we go up there and take our medicine. <laughs> Ka Kathleen also played. Uh, when you were playing, I think they had, uh, they, they paved the uh, Oh, course. yes. I, I didn't know I was all that much younger than y'all. We had a paved <laughs> court. <laughs> we had a paved court, yes, I remember that. They had a concrete, outdoor concrete court. That's yeah. right, and we had bleachers, too, for people to sit because I fell through them one time, and <laughs> I still got the scar. It was bad. <laughs> well, wasn't one of those ball courts where you go, Bouncing the ball, and all of a sudden the ball go off. Would they have a lot of lumps in the <laughs> lumps in it or anything? Well, they had cracks, and, and uh, if you didn't get that crack exactly right, the ball would would fly one way or the other. I believe. Yeah. Now, I don't. You never played on the. Yeah, they put it there the last year. I was the there. Last year you were there. Uh -huh. Yeah. Where was that school? Was it a, in relation? Was it down by Austin Cemetery, or was no, it further? It's the old Judy Rand. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, all right. right where. Judy Rand, his name. Oh, absolutely. Was mm -hmm. I remember you didn't get to high school until you turned and went on the other side, right? Yeah, one, one side of it. It was, it was like elementary. Elementary was, on one side yeah. and high school on the other. Yeah, I was the last place to graduate from 11 years. Uh -huh. in wow. Kitty Hawk. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't have a graduation class the next year, it went to 12. I needed that year, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did. <laughs> Let me tell you about one of the basketball games. The last game that Kitty Hawk played officially, the school, the, the school went to Manio in 1956, I think. But in 1955, the girls played Manio. Manio was always a rivalry, you know, with Kitty mm -hmm. Hawk. Of course, they were a rivalry with everybody. 
It's not, it hadn't changed. It hadn't changed, okay. <laughs> but uh, the, one of the times in the early days when uh, the Kitty Hawk School went to play Manio and Manio, Manio was so um, uppity that they they started the... Chris, you edit that out? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> they started the third awesome. string against the, uh, against the Kitty Hawk team, both girls and boys. Now, that's confident. Uh, I tell you, they had confidence. But anyway, the last game that the Kitty Hawk girls ever played, they played Manio, and they beat them. And one girl was, uh, I've forgotten what her name was. I think she was a Hines from uh, up in, I believe she was from up in Duck. And she scored like something like 36 points. Wow. She was like an eighth grader. Elsie mm -hmm. Hines. Yeah. And she whipped mm -hmm. She whipped Manu, so so Kitty Hawk got the, the advantage of them at least the last game of that ever played. Anybody in here want to bet whether or not Elsie Hines ever got a county job? <laughs> <laughs> not bloody <probably> likely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, da David, uh, have you got a question or two you want to ask this esteemed bunch? I'm fascinated. <laughs> okay, well, just... Ask us, ask a question. Uh, anything you want to think of here? Ask Bill. Tell about Captain Hobbs. Captain Jimmy Hobbs. Well, he was uh, he he was a seagoing captain. Married a lady who he had met in uh, in New York, and she had been born in England. He brought her back to Kitty Hawk, and they lived in a house that was just just beyond where the Catholic Church is today, but uh, on the north side of the road. In fact, Billy Gray lives in that location today. Uh, he had served during the Civil War as a pilot for Union vessels. He had joined the uh, Life Saving Service in, in uh, December the 1st, uh, uh, 1874, I think, and uh, eventually became the, the officer or, or the keeper of this Kitty Hawk station. And during the course of his uh, service, um, Keeper was like, you know, he was the, the man. The, the man. Mm -hmm. Well, he had a, uh, apparently had some kind of uh, misunderstanding with a, a, a person living in Kitty Hawk. And in fact, the fellow accused him of, of uh, using uh, life-saving service personnel to work his garden and... Uh, also, uh, he used the life saving service paint to paint his boat and use the uh, life saving service uh, line to, uh, to put on his vessel. And so this guy would kept constantly right into, uh, he also accused him of, uh, of taking stuff off of a ship that was wrecked on here and for his own use. And this guy kept right into uh, to the, key, the uh, superintendent of the life saving service. And, uh, and so they, they had a, so the guy was sent down from the Revenue Counter Service, an officer, lieutenant, to investigate. Well, when the officer came down, this gentleman came in and, and uh, uh, accused, uh, was using blasphemous uh, language against Mr. Hobbs and so forth. And apparently they'd had some kind of friction. I don't know what it was. But anyway, make a long story short, uh, Mr. Hobbs says, well, you have a pistol in your pocket and you're gonna, you, you wanna shoot me. And the man said, well, you're just a darn liar. You know, he didn't, he used a little more expressive than that. <laughs> and, um, and he said, oh, yes, you have. So the man kind of reached in his, reached for his pocket. And when he did, Captain Hobbs reached in a, a closet and pulled out a shotgun. <laughs> okay. And uh, the man started coming at him. He, he, hit him with the first shell, one, mm -hmm. one side of it. And then he went up and kind of pushed him back and, and then the guy kind of regained himself and came at him again and he, and he unloaded the second barrel on the guy and killed him. And so he, he was That's shot right here in, the, in this life saving station and for a long, oh long time All right. they said that you could see the blood stain on the floor, but I, I never saw that. But I mean, I understand. I never, I never did either. Pardon? David said, "Was it his table tonight?" <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, you know, 
at least on this one occasion, this gentleman, uh, one person has been killed in this Kitty Hawk Life Saver Station. Uh, Captain Hobbs was a uh, was a uh, quite a fr uh, he was a, really a leader in the community. He helped the Methodist Church, um, but he got old. His wife died in 1905, and after that, he kind of went downhill. And I remember Miss Maddie Maddie Richley telling me that you know, she grew up on Long Moor Shore Road and. Captain Hobbs was walking down the road one day and says, Captain Hobbs, where are you going? He's, he's getting old at this time. And he says, uh, well, I'm going down to, the, sun, down to the, the bay to dry myself. Okay, Captain Hobbs. So he goes on down there. And she kept, he, he, a little bit later, he came coming back and says, Captain Hobbs, I thought you were going to drown yourself. Water's too cold. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, they, uh, they, they, uh, he got so bad, I think he must have Alzheimer's or something. And, uh, and so some of the men got him uh, up in the hospital at the, uh, at the uh, Masonic Lodge uh, or the Masonic Hospital in Greensboro. And for 40 years, I wonder where he was buried. And I finally called the Masonic Lodge, and he's buried in Greensboro uh, in the Masonic home. Uh, uh, cemetery there, and his wife was, was buried next to the Kitty Hawk Methodist Church, but when they built the new church, they moved those bodies up to Austin Cemetery. Right. Well, that, that's amazing. I don't, thank, thank you for that, David. Uh, I've always heard uh, uh, something about this building here in a, in a shooting, but that uh, we got it straight from Bill Harris, so <laughs> if it came from Bill Harris, it's got to be true. Uh, <clears throat> folks, I, I told you that time was going to run here real quick. And, uh, I mean, we could be in here pretty late, but I'm going to take this opportunity. Uh, if anybody would have a question for Sam or Bill or Miss Kathleen, uh, now is the time. Any Geneva, Janelle, anybody, Shelby, anybody? Got to like Let me give you the microphone here. So. I'd like to tell a story on Sam's family. Can I tell it, Sam? Come on up here. I don't know, can you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when Sam lived up to... Uh, Cavazelli, you know, you picture the big Coast Guard station with these big porches on it. They lived over there, you know, and every September 1st, Mr. Waller would take his three boys and come to Kitty Hawk and cut their winter's wood. And they would haul it all up there, and they had a little shed they put it in. And anyway, later on, well, Sam's job was to take that wood and put it on the corner of the porch so that they could just slip out the door and get it and put it in the stove. So anyway, one day they had filled it up and they didn't use any of that night. The next morning, the old man looked out there and there was about four pieces gone. He said, uh-oh. So he, the next night he made sure that it was filled up again and nothing happened. But the next night, there was four pieces missing. So Mr. Walter said, boys, says, now don't y'all say nothing. So Mr. Walter took a piece of wood in his little shop there and he put it in a vise. He took a drill and he drilled a hole way up in it. He went over in the, in the station and got some gunpowder. <laughs> and he filled that piece of wood up with gunpowder and he drove a wedge in it and cut it off and you couldn't even count it. <laughs> so he said, now boys said, don't y'all don't say nothing now. We're going to find out who the hell is stealing out of wood. <laughs> so they, they put that piece of wood right down that corner. So next night, nothing happened next morning. And Mr. Walker said, don't touch it, boys. Go bring the wood in. So next night, next morning, it was gone. So that day at 12 o'clock, the Coast Guard's cook always, of course, had their meal. The boys were ready to eat at 12 o'clock. And they were all in the galley there eating, and all of a sudden they heard this explosion. And, well, I'm not going to call the man's name because he might have some relatives in here, but... <laughs> Somebody come running over there and said, <clears throat> Mr. Tillich, the kitchen's on fire. Help, come over here. <laughs> oh, Mr. Walter stood on the port, corner of the porch just like this, said, now I know who the hell is. <laughs> 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 
And another, uh, another good story about Sam. I'll get yours later. Uh, when Sam lived up at Kitty Hawk and everything, way back, you know, you know, back in the olden days, a lot of our cousins and uncles and all had a drinking problem, just like they got today. <laughs> we had a man in our village named Lawrence Perry. He wasn't ever married, so he don't have any kids in here. But the more Mr. Lawrence drank, the slower he drove his car. <laughs> so one night Sam was uh, eating with his family and all, and his dad in came a knock on the door. Old Mr. Lawrence, his daddy went to the door, and Mr. Walter says, Lawrence, how you doing? Mr. Lawrence said, well, Mr. Mr. Walter said, I'm in the marsh out here. Could you help me get out? <laughs> so Mr. Walter went out, and they hooked the horse up, and they went out there and hooked the horse to the little car, the truck. And it was just in the marsh a little bit. They pulled it right out, and he went on up to the, the graveyard to a family that lived there, and he had a few more drinks. <laughs> so they, Sam's family had finished eating, sitting in the living room, came a knock on the door. <laughs> Mr. Lawrence Perry had run his truck in the same spot <laughs> about four foot from where he went in, and he come and asked for help. But he weren't even quite so far, did he? Because he, he had a little more to drink. <laughs> so his daddy had to go pull him out again. <laughs> I'll tell you a quick story about Mr. David Stick. <laughs> it better be true. I'm not going to tell you the two stories I know about him. I'm going to tell you the one. Bill Foreman had a store here at Kitty Hawk, and us kids growing up, of course, we always stayed around there and played and had a big time. But Bill Foreman taught us a lot. He taught us how to fight. <laughs> and he tried to teach us how to shut up. But, he, <laughs> <laughs> but one evening, we had a local man named Colin Perry. Great big old guy. He was four times the size of Sam. And Bill Foreman had some bags of corn in there, and he wanted the corn toted out in the back. So we were messing. So somebody grabbed that bag of corn now and picked it up and pressed it over their head, you know. Well, I tried it, and I got it up to about here, and that was it. Colin Perry grabbed it, picked it up, put it up on this hand and pressed it up just like that. A whole hundred pound bag of corn now. That took a man to do that. All of a sudden we looked and there come a little car drove up and David Stick got out of it. And I said, hey fellas, let's see what this little blanky blank can do. <laughs> and he walked in, you know, and we, we started, uh, you know, uh, kidding him, you know. And I uh, said, so David, would you like to try it? David looked around at everybody. He walked over there. He reached his hands down. He grabbed that bag of corn up and pressed it up. And everybody just looked at him. Couldn't believe it. He said, I weren't in the Marine Corps for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen's dad and her brother, Mr. Aubrey Harris, when they were little boys, Around here, they got around by a sailboat, and they had been over to, over here to Curry Tower, somewhere in Massachusetts, or doing something, and they started home in the sailboat, and they got right in the middle of the sound, and it was a breath of air. There was no air. So, Jeff said to his brother, Aubrey, he said, Aubrey, he said, I heard one time that if you take a penny and you make a wish, and you throw it over your shoulder, that wish will come true. So old man Aubrey reached in his pocket and took a penny. He said, all right, Aubrey. No, he got a nickel. <laughs> he, he didn't have a penny. Well, I was. <laughs> <laughs> Who's telling this story? <laughs> so he took it and flipped it over his back. And he told his brother, he says, well, I wish for some wind. Well, nothing happened. Fifteen minutes after that, they looked up and they saw all these black clouds. 
and in 15 more minutes, that sailboat was doing 100 mile an hour going across it. So they had a good time. The tale goes that he said sailboat. if he knew it was a cheap, he wouldn't bought so much. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Good story about a uh, federal uh, government employee stealing wood from the home folks. Yeah, he got, I bet that stove was never the same again. That's probably the last time I ever cooked with that stove. Uh, anybody? Uh, Geneva, have you got anything? Janelle? Any? Come on here. All right. Well, are we ready to call it a night, Chris? You got you about out of tape? All right. Well, there's the cue. Folks, thank you so much for coming out. We appreciate you. This was a great crowd. I knew it was going to be good. I knew the time was going to go very quickly. But uh, I'd like to thank Sam. He's got his grandson, his son and grandson here. And uh, Kathleen's got some relatives. And Bill's got some family in here as well. Probably everybody in here is related in some fashion or another. But thank you so much for coming out. You've done a great job helping us out with uh, trying to preserve some of the culture, some of the heritage. Uh, some of the memories we've got here about this great place that we live in today that we know as Dare County and the Outer Banks. Have a good night.